Revelation chapter number three. Chapter number three. I was excited this morning earlier in the service by something that probably didn't excite you at all. I got to say for the first time, well, one of the first times in a year, <laughs> be seated and listen now as the choir sings. Amen. I, that was exciting. <laughs> I uh, haven't been able to have the choir and just uh, grew uh, concern and wanted to have an abundance of caution, but uh, now uh, just uh, opening that ministry back up and looking for this spring to be able to start several things back and just ease back into some areas of ministry. And I hope you'll join us in praying that uh, we aren't, uh, we don't want to be careless, we want to be cautious, but. We also want to be um, wise and uh, and be used of God, amen? We don't want to unnecessarily not involve ourselves in things. And so we're uh, slowly easing back into some areas of ministry. And, but that was exciting to be able to say, listen now as the choir sings. I enjoyed that part. I've already been blessed. Let's just dismiss and go home. Wow, I expected some amens there. But... Uh, uh, I think you knew I wasn't serious. Revelation chapter number three. Also want to mention, I forgot to mention it a moment ago, starting this Wednesday, Brother Wilcox will be pre, uh, preaching on Wednesday nights, teaching a series of lessons on the subject of prayer. And so the four Wednesday nights of, of February... Uh, maybe you uh, are not in the habit of being here on Wednesday nights. It would be really advantageous for you to try to at least carve out the Wednesday nights in the month of February uh, to, uh, to hear what uh, the Lord gives him concerning the area of prayer. I believe you said the first, uh, this next Wednesday subject will be the heart of prayer. Is that what you said? If he, now that now I've boxed him in, now he, it has to be that. Amen. And so the heart of prayer. And so the uh, prayer life of the Christian is, is sometimes the easiest to ignore. Um, and it ought not be so that that falls away from the Christian life. But it's like nobody sees my prayer life. And so if I don't do it, no one knows. But God knows. And it becomes evident in um, powerless Christians. And so uh, I encourage you to be here uh, starts the first one is this coming Wednesday night, and it'll be the four Wednesday nights of the month of February. I want to read one verse. We'll go back and pick up some others later, but the verse I want to read is probably familiar to you, but we don't often use it in its context, which is primarily how a verse should be used. In verse number 20, Revelation 3 and verse number 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. If you are familiar with the uh, second and third chapters of uh, the book of Revelation, you will remember that it records for us seven letters to seven churches that our uh, people want to know if they were real churches or if these are merely symbolic. And the, the short answer is these churches actually existed. These are letters that were written to seven actual churches. But what is true of churches um, in the north uh, is often also true of churches in the south. And that's true also of east and west. And that's also true of uh, when you escape the confines of time, uh, that uh, many of the things that they struggle with in past churches, we struggle with today and vice versa. And even all the way back to the first, uh, uh, the first churches of the, of the uh, Bible days, uh, the Bible says, for instance, they were already corrupting or twisting the scriptures before it was even before the Bible was even complete, and so uh, these letters to the seven churches here, recorded at the end of uh, the biblical record for us, are meaningful for us today. You, if you're familiar with them, you know who's speaking 
uh, that this is the Lord speaking to the churches. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's important to know who is speaking. And the Lord is standing at the door and knocking. And he says, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. I simply want to preach a message this morning. I'm entitling it, Jesus is Knocking. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Uh, you know the desire of my heart and what I want to convey today to Twin Ports Baptist Church. Lord, I ask that you would help me to clearly and succinctly do so. Uh, you also know that I have intentionally not tried to lay out a, a specific um, outline of words that rhyme or things like that. I want us just to think about the purpose and the message, and I pray that you will do that with us, that you will challenge our hearts from the words of Scripture, that it might not be what man has to say, but what you have to say to us. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name, amen. The end of chapter number three records the letter to the last of the seven churches, the church of Laodicea. Uh, some, uh, uh, invariably, someone asks me if, if these are indicative of ages, like church ages, beginning with the church of Ephesus being the church of the days of the apostles and ending with the last day's church, and that would be the Laodicean church. And I think, I don't know that there, I can say that there's no validity to that, but I will say this. You cannot strictly say that today the New Testament church has only the problems of the Laodicean church. In other words, failings of other churches that are listed here are often also failings of churches today. And in addition to that, there are no two churches this, the same today. And so we need to be careful about pigeonholing something and say it can only apply in this way and to this time. Because it does not stand that every church today has to be a Laodicean or lukewarm church. Just like it was not true in the day that this was actually written to the church of Laodicea, while the things that it says were absolutely true of the church at Laodicea, that doesn't mean it was true of every church of the day. And so I'm cautious to pigeonhole all of it, but it certainly does sound like in large part what is experienced today among uh, Bible-believing churches. And so it's an interesting thing, though, to recognize that Verse number 20 is very often used in evangelistic messages to where preaching to lost people about the, the uh, salvation that is available in Jesus Christ, the preacher will often use verse 20 and say, Jesus is standing knocking at the door of your heart and if you will open to him, he'll come in and sup with you and you with him. And I don't, even, I don't even take exception with that as an application. But we also need to recognize that when it was written, it was written to one of the seven churches. And so it has a unique interpretation and many other applications. And I do believe that the Holy Spirit does, uh, when we give the gospel out and when somebody hears the gospel message, I do believe that God is knocking at their heart, seeking for them to uh, call out to him in faith. I do believe that. But I also believe there's something here for the New Testament church to make sure we do not overlook it. And what we have here in this, and let's go back and just begin in verse number 14 under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen. The amen is Jesus Christ, God the Son. 
the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. That's not unique to the Laodicean church. He knew all of their works. That thou art neither hot, that, excuse me, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee, and uh, in verse number 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that, thy, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set, set, set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In all of these seven letters, you'll find that God knew their works and that God laid out if there was something that he had took exception with, he laid that out in the Laodicean church. He says in um, uh, beginning in verse number uh, 14 down, uh, down through verse number 17, he lays out what he has against the Laodicean church. And then beginning in verse number 18, he begins to give the advice. And he always ends with this advice, let the, uh, excuse me, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, you say, well, I can definitely see Laodicea in the churches today. We also need to be careful that we do not look culturally. Because while we could say, man, the church, New Testament church has never been richer, has never had more possessions, has never been more comfortable, that's because we live in the United States of America and you're not thinking about churches in parts of the world where there's severe persecution or poverty. So sometimes we look through the lens of our culture or our experience to try to interpret scripture, and we need to be careful about that because there are churches today that do not have buildings to meet in. They're not allowed to do so. I was just reading this week about a missionary, and I can't, I can't even, he's not out of the country yet. I can't even give his name nor the country. But he and his family were all arrested after being there about a year uh, print, translating and printing into the language the word of God and the gospel uh, and gospel tracts and they were arrested and after uh, some days of incarceration and interrogation it sounds like they're going to be not uh, imprisoned but they're going to be expelled from the country but it's all very tenuous right now it's just a matter of prayer you can't say that the New Testament church everywhere today is comfortable and, uh, and complacent or rich. As the Bible says about the Laodicean church, where he says here in, uh, in verse number 17, because thou sayest I am, in, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Boy, there's places where that is definitely not true. But the problem with this church was that they had become cold, excuse me, not cold, lukewarm, and complacent. What I find interesting and I want to talk about for the bulk of my time this morning is, I want you to think about what happens that causes the Lord to be on the outside of a place where he ought to be on the inside. And not only where he ought to be, but presumably once was on the inside. What happens to, to cause the Lord to be outside looking in? Uh, years ago on a, mission, on a mission trip down into 
I think it was down around um, uh, Monterey, and we were helping with some village uh, mission works and just some small little buildings. We would work on the buildings and build uh, build uh, seats, little benches in the day or pulpits in the day, and we would hand out literature in the afternoon, have services at night. And I remember some of those services where the building would be absolutely so jam-packed that we would be standing outside looking in windows. Now, there was, no, there was just openings in the side of the building. There weren't any actual windows, no glass in the windows. But we'd be standing outside looking in because there was no room to get in the building. So that's one possible cause. But that's not the problem with the church of Laodicea. What is it that causes the Lord to be outside looking in where he ought to be inside or even at one time used to be inside? You say, well, wait a minute, preacher. I, I see that in uh, chapter 3. It says in verse number uh, 20, if any man hear my voice. That doesn't sound corporate. That sounds individual. Well, I understand your your question, and here's the answer to it. The church is not a building. We are a, an assembly of people. We are a, uh, an assembly of born-again, blood-washed uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when God is speaking to the church, he's speaking to the people in the church. It is not a corporation that will open the door or not. It is people that will open the door or not. In other words, it's those in a church that will open the door. Not only that, it doesn't have to be, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, it doesn't have to be that everyone decides corporately let's open the door. Because it says, if any man will hear my voice. And open the door. In other words, we need to understand what it is that causes Jesus not to only be on the outside of the church when he ought to be in. What causes the Lord to be on the outside of the Christian life? And I don't mean he's, that he's left in the sense that you're no longer saved, but when he ought to be the central figure of the Christian life, how, what happens that causes the Lord to be on the outside looking in when he ought to be on the inside, when he, ought, when he at once was on the inside, when he once was the central figure? And I think we can find some help in answering those questions from the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church could, could say... If we had today, if we had a representative of all seven churches and they came up here today, y'all okay? Okay, y'all, I'm just wondering if you're bored. Because I'm excited about it, and I, you know, but my wife says sometimes nobody else is excited about what I'm excited about. So at any rate, like I say, I got excited about saying, hey, listen to the choir sing. Uh, so you probably didn't even notice I said it, but... If we had representatives of all seven churches here today and they had a chance to speak, it well could be said that the Laodicean church could look and say, well, you know, we weren't maybe all we should be, but we're not as bad as some. We didn't have the problem, say, of the uh, church of Ephesus, which said, though they had some good things going on, it also, it says... Uh, in verse number five, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. What had they fallen from? They had fallen away from their first love. Somebody heard kids screaming down the hall. Don't worry. It wasn't a panic scream. It was a fun scream. Amen. They left their first love. So he says, remember from whence thou art fallen. In verse five, and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. So they had left their first love. And so the Laodicean church could say, well, we're not as bad as the church of Ephesus because we, the, the, the Lord didn't say we left our first love. They, they, they could say, we're not as bad as the church of Pergamos. 
who he writes in chapter 2, in verse number 14, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou them uh, also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He is with he that hath an ear to hear. Let him hear. They could say, well, we're not all we ought to be. We're not necessarily as, as good as we should have been, but we're not as bad as the church of Thyatira. Because the church of Thyatira, the Lord says in verse number 20, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants and to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So the Laodicean church could say, look, we're not maybe all we ought to be, but we're not that. Let me just say this, you cannot offer someone else being worse than you as an excuse for being okay. Because the Lord Jesus Christ deals with you not on a sliding scale. You know, a sliding scale. Um, uh, when I was in Bible college, we had a, one or two professors, not very many, uh, that would uh, grade on the curve. And what that meant was they would, they, it was really, to me, it was, uh, it was because they weren't that good a teacher. But anyway, um, if they had a test where, like, no one did well, like the top grade was, you know, 60, they would just take the 60 and basically make it 100 and just work everybody down from there. They call it grading on the curve. God doesn't grade on the curve. He doesn't take all of Christians and say, well, they're none of them all they ought to be, so we'll just take the best, make them 100% and grade everybody else from there. You see, the standard is always the Lord. So there's always somebody, by the way, grading on the curve never worked if somebody got 100. If you were in that class and and you know, everybody failed except one person that got 100. You didn't like that person because they kept it from being graded on the curve. <laughs> well, there's always 100 because there's always the Lord. So compared to the Lord, where do we stand? And so we get back to the church of Laodicea and say, what is it that causes the Lord to be outside when he ought to be in? Knocking instead of uh, inside, fellowshipping. Well, let's look back there. The Bible says here in verse number 15 that they were neither cold nor hot. Lukewarmness caused the Lord to be outside instead of inside. Lukewarmness is a common failing, a common malady, a common disease among American churches in the day in which we live. Complacency. What does it mean to be complacent? Well, you don't realize where you are spiritually. You're comfortable. I, I, I wondered, and I've been, as I've been thinking about preaching this message for a couple of weeks now, I've, I've wondered several times if it, if it might not be true to say, it's far easier to bring a wicked man under conviction than it is a good man. Now, when I say a good man, I mean just a relatively good man. He's not, you know, he's not on fire for the Lord, but he's not immoral. And I wonder if it might be easier to bring a wicked man under conviction because he knows he's wicked. Where a good man thinks he's okay. And as long as the New Testament church, as long as the, the New Testament Christian is in this state of lukewarmness, he doesn't really see that he's all that bad. He might uh, once in a while realize, well, I could probably do more, but he really thinks that he's all right. It caused the Lord to be outside looking in 
and not on the inside. We talk often about the presence of God, but I want to make an admission to you that while we talk about the presence of God, very few of us today have any idea what it is. Having not seen it, experienced it, you can imagine. But it happens so rarely today that really God in the fullness of his power is able to work in our life or in our churches. I wonder today, we talk about his presence, we say we desire his presence, and we're being sincere. We, we, we are being earnest in it, I believe. But we also really have very little idea of what all it means. It's certainly not more programs or making sure that, you know, everything is orchestrated and scheduled to the minute. Those are not the signs of the presence of God. And so one thing I believe that in the Christian life or in the New Testament church that causes the Lord to be outside looking in is when we become lukewarm, we become complacent in our Christian life and in our service. The bills are paid. The lights are on. The heat is comfortable. And everything seems to be okay. We've got a church to go to when we feel up to it. When we want to, uh, to go, we've got nothing else to do. For those few weeks out of the year that, you know, it's, it's, uh, you've got the, the time between your summer activities and your winter activities. <laughs> you've got a few weeks there where you can't really do much of any because the ice is no good or, or it's too, too rainy and sloppy. And so, well, those weeks we'll go to church. You've got one to go to, glad of it. You say, well, preacher, wait a minute. Don't beat us up too bad. We're here today. I get that. But can we not sense a lukewarmness overall among Christians and maybe sometimes in our own life? Neither hot. You say, how do you know if you're lukewarm? If you can describe yourself as neither hot nor cold. Let's just be honest for a moment. We can't be honest with each other, but we can be honest before the Lord individually, can't we? If we can describe ourselves to the Lord as neither hot nor well, Lord, I know I'm not zealous, but I'm not, I'm not cold either. It's not that I don't care. What we're doing is we're describing ourselves to the Lord as lukewarm. And it causes the Lord to be to say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Then he says here, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor and blind and naked. The second thing that I believe causes the Lord to be outside looking in, trying to get in when he ought to be in, is a lack of holiness. You say, where do you get that, preacher? Well, I get that from the advice that the Lord gives the Laodicean church. Notice what he says. I counsel thee to buy gold tried in the fire. Thou mayest be rich. In other words, the things that create true riches are the spiritual things, not the possessions. And then he says, notice this, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. In the Bible, what is the white raiment always, what is it always doing? What is the robe of Christ's righteousness always doing? If not covering our sin. When we lack holiness. Well, you say, well, preacher, we're not ungodly. There again, I propose to you that it's far easier to bring under conviction a wicked man than it is a good man. Ungodliness or a lack of holiness causes the Lord to be outside. Well, why can't the Lord just be content that we're basically good people? 
I see here where the Lord says, I would that you were cold or hot, not lukewarm. While I think the Lord does not really specifically say why, I think maybe we can draw a conclusion that the things that the Lord points out in these seven churches, he said, here's the remedy. Here's what you have to do. Here, when you, Listen, when you allow uh, the sin of the Nicolaitans, when you allow the prophetess Jezebel and her idolatry, when you allow uh, these kinds of, of uh, uh, immoral things, when Church of Corinth, when you allow uh, the immorality that's going on, hey, he, it's easy. He can point out the remedy, and it's easy to see what has to be done and what has to be fixed. When you're on fire for God, uh, and, the, and the fire of, of zeal burns in your heart. And you're zealous for the things of God. You're going for God and God is present with you and working with you and, uh, and you sense his power and you are efficacious in your ministry and, and in prayer. Your prayers are being answered and God is working. But when the Christian becomes lukewarm, it's almost as if not that there is no remedy, but it's certainly not a quick, easy identification and fix for us because we don't see what we're doing that's all that bad. We're, we're, not, we're not committing uh, any really bad things. We're omitting some things maybe we ought to have, but we're not committing any really bad things. Listen, it, it is, it is uh, we believe that it is we are close to the coming of Christ. We hope that it is so. But I think sometimes we hope so intellectually, but not spiritually. That if, if we got a bulletin right now that the Lord's going to be here at noon, which I think is in four minutes, would we or would we not say, uh, preacher, Start the invitation now because there's some things I got to do. Because it be, become imperative. And we say, we want the Lord to come, but not really today. We jokingly say, you know, when we were helping one of our daughters, you know, going through all the process of getting ready for their wedding and you know, you're trying to design invitations and we've got to have a tent and we've got people and all this stuff. And I said, boy, I hope Jesus comes before the day of the wedding. <laughs> I was like, Dad, I want to get married. <laughs> well, then you stay here. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I don't know what you want, but, you know. <laughs> but sometimes... It's not that far off of the attitude that many of us have about the coming of Christ. We want him to come, but, but Lord, there's things I want to do or things I haven't seen yet or things I want to experience yet. But don't we, aren't we really, if we are honest about it, if the Lord came today, we wouldn't miss any of those things we have not done. And so what causes the Lord to be on the outside looking in? when we become comfortable and complacent, when we lack holiness and godliness in our life. <clears throat> and then the other thing about the church of Laodicea I want to point out quickly here is that they were blind to their own condition. They are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And when you think about that list, you're miserable, you're wretched, but you're blind to the fact of it. I mean, if you know that those are the conditions, you can do something about it. You know, sometimes you, you get to church and you walk in the restroom down there and you happen to walk in front of the mirror and then it's like, who let me out of the house looking like that? You know, something you didn't notice or whatever. It's like, you didn't know. 
One of my favorites a few years ago was at conference. I use this because it's nobody here. There are other examples we could use of people here. I'm not permitted. Lady from another church out in the hallway. One of our men, they were out, were having services. They're out in the hallway, not where they're supposed to be. One of our men meets them out in the hallway trying to help them. While he's standing there talking to him, the lady slip just drops right to the floor, right, right around her ankles. And of course, our, our poor man is just like, oh, I don't know. I guess you go down there and ask somebody down there to help you, you know, just like, and just walked off. Didn't know. No, no clue. No clue. I mean, people, blindness, blindness is a, a terrible condition. I, I, I'm one of the saddest it, to, to me. Everybody has their favorite verses in the Bible, their, their least favorite, or their, the things they think are great, or things they think are tragic in the Bible. One of the most tragic accounts of a person in the Bible to me has always been Samson. And it's not of what he had and lost and... Well, he came back and he was, he, you know, killed more in his death than he did in his life, and I get all that. But here's what I think is the tragic part of the life of Samson, or the story of Samson, is that after he had lost the power of God, he didn't even know it was gone. It's amazing to me, especially since the power of God in his instance was amazing strength, right? Right? I mean, it's like, how do you not know that's gone? He got up and he shook himself at his, as at other times. He had no idea. Spiritual blindness. And we often are blind to what is lacking in our life. Without the Holy Spirit of God and the wor Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, we, we are clueless as to where we are falling short. Oh, how we need to have eye salve from God's word that the Holy Spirit applies to our, to our spiritual eyes so that we'll see how wretched and blind and naked we are spiritually. What causes the Lord to be outside looking in? Spiritual blindness of the New Testament church or New Testament Christians. It's not just outside the church. He's outside of where he ought to be at the center of our life. And these things cause the Lord to say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But there's a remedy. There's always a remedy. It doesn't matter which of these seven churches that you think is the worst, there's always a remedy. They always end with, let, uh, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the, what the Spirit is saying in the churches. But the remedy, and by the way, I, I'm encouraged in verse 19, the Laodicean church, the church that God would spew out of his mouth because of lukewarmness, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Hey, God, God's not giving up. God, because of the, uh, the, he's on the outside looking in, he still has not, he still, st he could have left, and he's still knocking. Still chastening, still rebuking, calls us to be zealous, therefore. By the way, the remedy for lukewarmness is not a low heat. It's the burner on high. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It's what the Bible would describe as repenting with tears. And the Bible says, if any man will hear my voice, the first thing we have to do is hear God's voice. You know, you might be spiritually blind to your condition, but if you have spiritual hearing, you can hear the Lord call. You can hear him knocking as, the, as you read the word of God, as the spirit of God speaks to you through the word of God. You can hear and realize, you know what, I, that, that's me. 
The Lord's outside looking in when he ought to be inside. And maybe he used to be inside. But if we hear his voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. He's speaking to the New Testament church, but the New Testament church is not a, it's not a building. It's not an institution. It is individuals assembled together for Christ, in the name of Christ. It is his. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. He built his church. And if we will hear his voice and open the door. But as I said Wednesday, from the book of Isaiah, as we were doing our Bible study on Wednesday, the problem with Israel was not that they had gone into idolatry. The problem was that though they had gone into idolatry, God had judged them, there was no man to stir up himself to take hold of God. I do not want to imply that it is us in the flesh saying, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. The Holy Spirit of God has to work or we'll never see it. He has to use the word of God or we'll never hear it. But once he moves in our heart, then we must respond. We must act. We must say, I'm going to open the door. I'm going to search and feel after him. If I might find him as, the, as we read last week. We are coming to the end of this age, I believe, in which we live. We believe we're coming to the end of it. The Bible talks about when he comes, will he find faith in the earth? Listen, Christian, it's not about what's going on in Africa anywhere or, or Europe anywhere. It's not even what's going on in the south somewhere or other churches, whether a long ways away or across the city. It's where we are with the Lord. It doesn't, doesn't do to compare ourselves among ourselves. The Bible says that's not wise. But the Lord is outside when he ought to be inside. When we become complacent and comfortable. He's outside looking inside when we lack holiness and godliness. He's outside looking inside uh, when, we, uh, when we are blind to our own conditions what we need is his robe or his raiment white raiment what we need is eye salve from the Lord so that we can see we need gold tried in the fire that which is purified our works for the Lord being pure and that's the, the the connection the connotation there is pure works for God Things tried in his fire. And until we seek God's remedy, Jesus is knocking. Yes, I believe that when we witness to somebody, you can say the Lord is knocking on their heart, wanting to save them. I believe that's true. But this ends with, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We need to be mindful of the fact that we don't want the Lord outside looking in. Father, I pray that as we sit here today and I look around this room, that there will be some that that will allow themselves to be moved to the point of being the man in this passage that opens the door. And I don't mean opening the door for everyone else. I mean for, the, for our own life. If we have ears to hear and the Spirit of God is speaking to us, all we can do is open the door for ourselves. But in so doing, because we assemble together, it will impact others. God, that there will be men and women, young and old, married and single, that will say, I hear the Lord knocking in my life because I am 
lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, because I am complacent, because I'm not zealous for the things of God, because I'm not the worst person that there is, but I'm not all I ought to be. This Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart, and I want to open the door and let him turn the fire up in my life to have a zeal and a passion for the house of God and the things of God for souls to be saved and prayers to be answered to be a vessel that God can use as Timothy says uh, fit or meet for the master's use God, I pray that in all these things we might look to Jesus. May it not be a one-shot, one-and-done thing where we say, okay, I want that, and then we go and forget what manner of man we are. But that we might keep looking into the perfect law of liberty and see ourselves and see, more importantly, Jesus Christ. That we might begin a pattern of new zeal for the Lord and new passions for God. New obedience, new holiness, new godliness, new victory over past sin. God, that it might be so that we would find that it brings honor to you and you use us. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name with our heads still bowed and our eyes.